Well, welcome everybody to Supporting Every Student Online. We're going to talk about differentiating literacy instruction across content areas. As you very well may be familiar, literacy touches every part of your curriculum, especially when you're teaching online. Um, words are our chosen medium right now, um, as well as video and, and so many other things, but I think words are are tying everything together in writing. Um, and I am so excited to introduce Stephen and Shaylin, both from Web20 Classroom, um, incredible experts, authors. If it, no one has joined this yet, this is an amazing community. EdWeb created an online learning community. I can only imagine it will continue to grow with amazing resources. All right, and who is writable? So, Writable is who I uh, work for. I am a former teacher, and I am so excited to share uh, a really pedagogically sound writing program. Uh, we're research-backed. We've won a lot, of, a lot of awards. It says 6,000 schools and districts, but we're actually up to about 8,500 right now. Um, and we really save teachers time, and we can grow great writers faster. Uh, writable can be used both for in-person instruction, for virtual instruction and for blended learning, it really allows you to go seamlessly between those three. Um, and it's used for writing practice, assessments, and really guiding feedback. Um, and Project Write Together is an amazing program we're putting on that connects students virtually across the globe in uh, writing prompts so they can anonymously peer review. We also have a whole uh, writing, a virtual learning center, writable.com slash virtual learning is where you can sign up and check it out. Um, you can also check out our past webinars that we've been doing on virtual learning on EdWeb. And then you can also sign up for a free account. Writable is three free through the remainder of the school year. And it really integrates with your LMSs, Google Classroom. It has a lot of content um, and allows you to power your literacy instruction online. And of course, to introduce the wonderful Stephen and Shaylin, uh, we've got an amazing amount of accolades here. I am curious, what are the highlights that you guys would want to pull out? What are you most proud of? Steven, that's oh, all you. You go first. <laughs> um, for me, um, I, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I'm, I'm very proud of the, the three books that I've written on being a connected educator and curating content and, and especially um, how administrators can can use technology, but certainly um, if anybody is on Twitter and they've ever heard of the hashtag EdChat, um, I uh, am responsible for creating that hashtag. So um, that is probably one of the coolest things that I've ever done, especially being able to see how it's helped connect people from all over the world and seeing what it's grown into over the last 15 years. That's right, and I'm Shaylin Farnsworth, and I'm from Iowa. Um, for those people that don't know, something about Iowa you may not know is three C's, as, as Stephen often says. It is um, corn, cows, and computers. And so when I started my um, career, teaching career, 20-plus uh, years ago in the classroom, um, about eight years in, we started a, a technology integration program at the school. So technology and literacy is my jam. Um, I love teaching writing. Uh, I'm an avid blogger. I'm connected on social media. Um, so you can follow me on Twitter. And I also get to do cool things with Steven. And I love Writable. And I love supporting their platform. So that's why we are here. It's just sound and pedagogy. It's, it's something that writing teachers love. Yeah, and you know, so many other teachers, because uh, we're going to be talking about literacy across the content area. So whether you are teaching science or social studies or psychology or history, um, I know even some math teachers that are using Writable and uh, doing writing prompts. So also, don't forget to follow these folks on Twitter, because they're pretty amazing. Um, That's right. Yeah, so passing it off to you guys. And I'm going to keep putting in the resources. If you guys want to follow along, everything they talk about will be listed there. That's right. So welcome. Um, we are so excited to have everyone here. We're very passionate. Stephen and I are very passionate, passionate about not only literacy, but differentiation across, across the curriculum, making sure that, um, 
uh, all students' needs are met. Tess did drop in the link to all of our resources and all of our slides, so you don't have to worry about capturing things. They're all right there for you, along with how to contact us, how to get in touch with us, and the slide deck. So um, we're excited to have you here with us. So here's the agenda. Stephen, um, we can do this together, literacy across the content area. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i very open about the fact that um, I when I ask any literacy questions, I go straight to Shaylin because she is probably the most, you know, sought after expert in the literacy field. And um, for me, I was, a, I was a science and math teacher. And so um, there are some things that I've learned along the way about literacy in the content area, but also some things that I've um, learned recently that, that we want to share with folks. That's right. Then we're going to um, look at differentiation and how literacy is a part of differentiation, how we can do that remotely. And uh, we're going to share tons of resources and communities. Again, Tess is dropping in that link. Heidi, one of the co-founders from Writable, is also online with us. She will be answering questions and dropping in the links for the resources as well. And we'll end with any questions you may have. So go ahead and, and uh, pop in your questions at the at the icon above. Um, so we're jumping right in. Uh, do you feel that you have an effective remote teaching system in place? We know, Stephen, across the country, um, while states are figuring out exactly what they're going to do at the end of the year, um, a lot of them have transitioned to online. I know in Iowa, they just made a decision last week. We are done. Schools face-to-face -face are closed to the end of the year. In my kids, I have a, a middle school and a high schooler, and they're both working on voluntary because of um, the equity and access issues. Um, but uh, voluntary enrichment supplemental online instruction. Elementary, it's um, through uh, packets that they send home, um, but middle school on up, it is online. What about where you're at in North Carolina, Stephen? Yeah, I have I have two daughters in elementary school, and, and our district has actually done an incredible job, and um, I don't want to take any kind of credit for that because I used to be the tech director here, but um, but certainly they've done they've done a, a fabulous job of, of getting devices to every kid, getting hotspots to every kid, and uh, and and making sure that, that that learning continues. We don't have a decision yet, but certainly I know it can be a challenge. And when I've talked to districts here recently about this, um, it's a challenge. You might have thought that you had a plan in place, like, you know, hey, we're going to institute blended instruction, but this is a completely different animal altogether. And so um, it's important, especially what we're talking about today with differentiation and literacy, it's important that we beef up those plans as we go. So, All right, so I'm going to pull Tess back in. Tess, what are the results? What are you seeing? So I'm seeing mostly no's, which I am not shocked about because it is really hard and overwhelming to just jump right into virtual instruction. I am seeing some yeses. To all of the yeses, I would love if you were sharing what was working for you with your uh, your fellow attendees who are answering no and somewhat or trying or overwhelmed. Um, I would love to then be able to like share what is effective for you and what's working. Um, I thought that was interesting. Someone said no equity issues. Um, I yeah. think that's a really important thing um, to talk about is uh, issues with equity and online learning. But yeah, lots of lots of no, some yeses. I think probably all overwhelmed. Yeah. So to start off with a few caveats, um, Stephen, equity matters. Yeah, I mean, and that's what I just put in the chat. I mean, the number one thing that has to be considered in any kind of remote learning plan isn't the device, isn't the platform, isn't the actual learning. It's how are we going to ensure that the learning is equitable for every student and not just in terms of, of students who have devices at home or who have access at home, but students who have particular needs, um, special education students, you know, th those diverse learning needs transcend um, whether the learning is remote or face-to-face. Or -face. And so that equity question has to be answered first before any plan can be put in place. That's right. Um, virtual teaching is not new, which is true. There's tons of research out there, especially in higher ed, some um, in K through 12 with online instruction. But what is new is that quick pivot that so many of us had to do. Friday, we were face to face with our kids. Monday, we were expected um, to be virtually uh, online supporting students. And so there's very little research out there on how that looks. And so we're, we're leaning on each other and learning, leaning on what we know as 
true as teachers, um, as parents, uh, as, as caregivers, um, to do what's best for kids. We also know that relationships are the core of teaching. Stephen? Well, yeah. And, and I mean, you know, we, we can spend, you know, massive amounts of time trying to plan lessons to, you know, not, you know, that, that will never replicate what the, the actual learning that happens in the classroom. But those teachers that are telling us that they're, they're actually able to make this transition smoothly is because of the relationships they have in place. I mean, I look at my, my first grader, her teacher um, it, it had incredible relationships with her students and has continued to have those relationships. And it transcend again, transcends the use of the technology and whether or not it's, again, remote or, or face-to-face, those relationships are hugely important. That's right. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about differentiation, but it is still needed and it's definitely possible. And we're going to give you some tips, some resources, and some strategies to hopefully help you um, when you when you tackle those issues. And finally, tools help, yet teaching matters most. What do you think, Stephen? Agreed. And, you know, it, it, it's not just about using the, the flavor of the week when it comes to ed tech. It's the actual pedagogy and content that comes along with it. Tools come and go but strong pedagogy will last forever. That's right. And I'm going to pull Tess back in because she says this all the time. We can do this together. Tess has not um, told you guys, but she is a former classroom teacher as well. And her heart is with you guys. She is she is definitely one that says, what can we do to support these teachers? And what do you want people to know, Tess, about Writable? I want people to know this about Writable, but literally every every single ed tech company out there, we're here to help you. We're here to support you. We're here to help you with lesson planning. We're here to help you with your curriculum. Um, reach out to us and ask us questions. Uh, you can always email us at Writable, but I would suggest us at every ed tech company. Um, we want to be your partner right now. We want to help you. We want to help your students. Um, so right. let us be that for you. That's right. Not only taking care of all of our kids with not only their educational needs, but Let's be honest, some kids need those basic needs as well. Their families are, are struggling during these times and they need access to food and water and education is the last thing um, on their minds right now. But uh, we also need to take care of each other um, as educators because we have so many different tops we're spinning here. Um, but let's dive into the content here um, because literacy across the content area, if you haven't realized it yet, once you move everything virtual or, or online, students consume information through some sort of text or visual and they show and demonstrate their understanding through some sort of visual, um, applying it through text. And so it's a, it's a two-way street, but it's now more important than ever because we don't have that face-to-face -face connection with them. Um, I love always when I'm working with teachers, starting off with, you are the best reader and writer in the classroom. Um, and this is something that I've heard Kelly Gallagher say many times. And, uh, that's how I always start off when I'm working with a group of teachers across disciplines, letting them know, uh, you are the best reader and writer in the classroom. You went to college, you have that four year degree. Um, and, uh, you may not feel like you're qualified to teach literacy, but when you step back and break it down, it's easier than you think. What do you think, Stephen? It took me a long time as a teacher to realize this, and, and I, I regret that I didn't realize it earlier in my career. And, you know, I, I taught science and math, and and I wish that I had had the, I wish I could go back to that person who, who taught those, those kids my first year and second year and third year in school and, you know, and say, you know, you're doing this wrong. You know, you are a reading teacher. You are a writing teacher. And, you know, it's easy to get caught up in the content, especially in things like mathematics and science and formulas and algorithms and not realize that all of that is reading, all of that is writing, all of that is literacy. Um, and it's important to have that strong foundation for no matter what content, PE, music, whatever the content area is, it's, it's important to have that strong foundation. That's right. And so um, I know many states are using um, the Common Core state standards or a version of them. And what uh, they they imply is that everyone has standards in, in reading and writing um, that they need to support throughout the disciplines. Um, and like we said uh, earlier, now more than ever before, um, especially when everything is online and virtual, we see the need for those. Um, so asking yourselves for reading what types of texts occur in the 
those content areas, types of writing, and the role of speaking and listening will be extremely important. And tell me a content area that doesn't do that, that doesn't have any kind of reading or writing or speaking and literacy. It, again, I use that word transcends now three times. I need to find a new word. Uh, it, it, it really works across every single subject area. Um, and that's why it's so critically important. Even now in these remote situations, this has become, you know, it has become even more amplified um, than perhaps maybe it was face to face. That's right. And so when I work with staff um, that have, let's say, everything from a PE teacher to a calculus teacher, right, um, I have them think about it not in reading and writing standards, but what students must learn, what they need to do in order to successfully participate in that discipline. And so just that simple shift in the frame helps bring it more accessible to um, to teachers and across those disciplines. Um, it also requires an approach that honors the expertise of content area. Teachers, they have to realize, again, like Kelly Gallagher, Gallagher said, you are the best reader and writer in the classroom. Maybe uh, you don't feel like you can teach literacy, but you can definitely identify uh, what they need to learn, what they need to do, and how they need to participate in your discipline. So let's take, for instance, this KWL. How many people have used KWL in their own classroom or a version of it? Yeah, uh-huh, lots of people, right? And so, Stephen, what does KWL stand for? What do I know, what do I need to know, and what do I, what am I, uh, what am I gonna learn? That's right, and so usually, typically, it is um, supported as a bullseye, right? So what do you know in the center? What do you want to know and questions, and then what do you learn? This is seen as a, as a strategy that goes across disciplines, but, um, as uh, Elizabeth Mohi says, deepen that definition when you customize the KWL according to content areas. So she still has those three steps in there. She just asks, what would that look like, for instance, in science? What do you observe? What do you infer? And what do you conclude? Or maybe in a far foreign language. Listen, comprehend, and speak. Stephen? That's why this is so genius in that not only are you still able to take the foundation of, you know, KWL, what do you know, what do you want to know, what do you, what do you learn, but now you can put it in specific language for that, um, for that content area that really drives home what that content is about. I know in science all the time, we observe, we, we, we infer, we conclude, and in math, we're deconstructing how mathematics works. We're solving, and then we're applying that. Uh, you know, it's great because it brings in that language that may feel unfamiliar to students, um, but puts it in a very familiar context. Be like, oh, yeah, that totally makes sense. That's exactly what we do as a, as a historian, or that's exactly what we do in art. It, it puts it in that context that begins to help it make sense, and it helps for the teacher to understand, the educator to understand how, how can this work in my classroom. That's right. So the common KWL that we have all learned, that we all love, um, that has morphed throughout the years, when you customize it for disciplines, it becomes more meaningful. Um, and again, this is all linked on your resources, so you can definitely have copies of this. And I love it, too. How many people have seen this one? I know, Stephen, you have because you are an ASCD emerging leader. Anybody seen this one? Catherine has, she said. So this is a is a great um, table, and it is, again, linked on your document. And it asks yourself, what does it look like to read, write, and think in different disciplines? And this really helps frame that work with educators um, so that they are confident in supporting students, not only accessing and absorbing their curriculum and their content, but also then applying it. Um, and this is linked on the document as well. Uh, but we're going to dig into just one. And I chose this one just for Stephen, because you were a middle school science teacher. Any middle school teachers out there? What, what? They're just a different breed, aren't they? they we, we are a different breed. <laughs> That's right. And so when you look at a scientist, um, what, what can you tell me, Stephen, about reading, writing, and thinking? What is specific well, to in, just in, the discipline? Yeah, I mean, in, in science, science is, is just like we looked at with, with, the, with the, the specific language around KWL. It's about observation. It's about 
Um, not just asking what's happening, but why is what's happening. Um, and so when we're reading, when we're when we're reading or we're looking at data or we're we're reading, um, you know, scientific literature or articles, we're asking why did they come to that conclusion? We know what the conclusion was. It's it's clearly there. Why did they get there? Why after that experiment, um, as they're communicating those ideas, why did they get there? Um, and obviously one that e even goes beyond science is determining the validity of sources. Is the is the 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 study that was done, is the data that was gathered, is it valuable? Is it is it um, reliable? Is it valid? Um, it, it, it all is is important as we read, but certainly um, uh, is important, again, across curriculum areas. As we're right, we're using that precise vocabulary. We're using passive voice. Um, when we're thinking, we're, we're thinking back to our knowledge that we have. We're considering new, new hypotheses. We're not closed-minded. We're very open-minded in thinking, I may not have the right the right conclusion, where where does that take me? Uh, and so, again, it, to, now, I, these are all things I wish I had known back when I was teaching, um, because they're so. It, it just makes it makes it click, right? It makes it it makes it so much easier to understand how this can work in, in any classroom. And, and what's great about that table is a lot of people who hadn't seen it um, gives tons of examples across different um, curriculum areas. That's right. And so one thing that Stephen and I love to always do is let you leave not only with ed tech resources, but with specific strategies that are sound in pedagogy that you can use the next day in your virtual online classroom or in your face to face classroom. And so uh, kind of branching off, I want you to take the science lens again, Stephen. Um, here are different strategies. Now, mentor examples. I saw tons of preschool, lower elementary teachers. You know what I'm talking about when I say mentor examples and mentor texts. A mentor example or text is um, something that would be an exemplar model, right? So uh, in science, you think of a, a scientific report or a table that students can look at and, and ask themselves and approach through many different ways. How can I mimic this? align this, parallel this in my own writing. Um, think aloud. We also have text claims and evidence and interpretive frameworks. So Stephen, you talk about this in scientific terms. What did you do with all of your middle school kids at the at the beginning that basically goes through all these different strategies? So one of the things I to get them thinking about scientific processes and why it's important to follow steps and procedures um, was I would have I would they would come into class one day and I would have bread peanut butter and jelly sitting on my my lab table in the front of the room and I would ask them to recite the steps of making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich um, and of course you know you think in your mind you know it's something you've probably done a hundred times um, but when you when you have to actually interpret that and write that down it's easy to to miss steps and so I would they would you know have a couple minutes to do it. They would come up and, and I would say, okay, give me your instructions and I'm going to follow your steps, step one. And so, you know, the first kid might come up and say, okay, step one is put peanut butter on the bread. And so I would take peanut butter, but I wouldn't have any bread because they didn't tell me to get out how much bread to get out. Am I, was I supposed to take it out? Was I supposed to put it on a plate? Where was I supposed to put it? So, you know, I see there's other people who are saying building a snowman, tying a shoe, all of those, all of those things, um, especially in science, get to the, the heart of that. Uh, of, of why it's important we have procedures, but also that it taps into that critical thinking of why I need to think through my steps. Um, and, and, and all we did all of these things through, through that one activity of having that example and thinking aloud and, and all of those things. That's right. And so you would use yourself as a mentor text and your writing, and then you would think aloud through it. Um, you would talk about that precise vocabulary needed for science, and you would share with them some frameworks. So let us give you some um, some strategies and some frameworks that you can use across disciplines, um, but also in your own classroom, because I know that there's a lot of ELA teachers there. So this one is specific for math, and I know, Stephen, you taught science and math. Have you ever heard of ridges before? I hadn't, but, you know, as we were, as we were putting some of these things together, this one um, is another one I wish I had had um, in, in mathematics when I was teaching. 
So everybody is used to um, seeing those word problems, correct? And they're often on those high stake tests. And you ask yourselves, is it really that they don't understand the math or can they not even access the math because they don't understand the word problem, right? And so teaching them those literacy skills are important. How do you tackle word problems? Well, this is a favorite amongst math teachers. It's called RIDGES. And RIDGES stands for read the problem. I is identify all the information. D is draw a picture, G is goal statements, E is equation development, and S is solve the equation. So Stephen, why do you as a former math teacher love using something like this? It, it really helps students decompose what the questions are asking for because, you know, a lot of times with word problems, even my, my own daughter, my oldest, um, my 11-year-old, she word problems are her arch nemesis. Give her the algorithm, she can do it all day long. Put it in a word problem and it suddenly comes apart. And so for, for, for those analytical thinkers, it's important to deconstruct what problems are asking us to do. And this taps into different, uh, different ways of students to look at that, that problem from its entirety. Not only are they identifying what it is that the question is actually asking them, but maybe maybe a drawing, and it, you know, again, it's not it's not an art class. It could be a ten frame. It could be it could be any kind of drawing. Um, and then what ultimately what is it that they're trying to get to? And then they can plug in the algorithm. Then they can solve the equation. That's right. Here's another one. This is a chemistry note taking sheet. Um, just something simply to guide their thinking, to guide their reading um, as they dissect all of those scientific texts is extremely important. And again, these are all linked on the resource sheet. I really like this herringbone diagram. And this was something used in history classes. Have you seen this one, Stephen, before? It helps people I, recognize relationships. Yeah, I've seen this one before. I I had never I had never used it, but it's a great way to look at, like you just said, how those um, how different um, pieces are relation are in relationship to each other, um, especially in history when you're looking at different events or periods in time. How do they relate to each other, and and why? What, what effect does it have? Uh, sometimes those those graphic organizers. There's you know we could do a whole other webinar on just you know amazing graphic organizers. Um, that it, it's that organization of of ideas into that uh, into that format can really um, turn the light bulb on for for a lot of kids to help them see uh, what it is they're actually learning. That's right. And I know uh, Tessa's like, don't forget, Writable has graphic organizers. Yes, they do. They have tons of them. Um, you can also add your own as a, as a teacher. And I think it's, it's, an, it's an important scaffold. Yes, you can have students create their own, but sometimes they need those stepping stones, those scaffolds to help them organize their thoughts and fill their toolboxes in the literacy world. So it's extremely important to have those as well. Um, so those, those are some of our favorite strategies you may not know of, along with the KWL. Again, we link tons of things in there for you. But I love to always end with this. So if you're working with a group of teachers on literacy across the discipline, I love these three questions um, and how I did this. And I and I always think about um, that second question, Stephen, if you are a subject matter teacher, think about and discuss processing the text you read in your discipline. So, for instance, I would always have them bring in a, a piece of common text from their classroom, such as a calculus problem. Uh, maybe it's a uh, Romeo and Juliet play. Maybe it is um, a piece of sheet music from the music teacher or uh, a healthy schedule and weightlifting schedule from the PE teacher. And then they go ahead and deconstruct this with a partner. They have the partner share. What do you notice about this? How would you tackle this? What, you know, where would you even start? And it's always uh, amusing for them to hear somebody in a different discipline try to figure out that stuff. And then they realize, I do know how to deconstruct all of these texts. So that is something well, um, that I love. And, and remember really quickly, the first thing we said was you are the best reader and writer in your in your classroom, whether you realize it or not. And that activity can be hugely eye-opening into understanding the processes that the students go through. I mean, it's easy to have that lens from of seeing that what, what students are struggling with, but when you put that content in front of another adult, 
um, who have maybe very little exposure to it, it be, you begin to become enlightened as to, oh my gosh, how can I help them better understand this? Um, it's a great activity to do as part of a PLC, even remotely. I mean, that could even be done right now over video really quickly, 20, 30 minutes um, can really help um, improve how students are 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 engaging in the content um, in those in those various content areas. That's right. And Stephen, he so graciously um, created three different STEAM examples that include the writing in there, perfect for the virtual learning environment. One is the six brick Lego challenge, um, a science one for typhoid Mary, and the music one, Beethoven and mathematics. Stephen, if you had to choose one of your favorites that you created, which one's your favorite? Which one should they definitely check out? Oh, it's one of those like three. It's like and they're they're all my children, so it's hard to pick a favorite. But the you know I I love Legos, and um, that six brick challenge is pretty it's pretty cool. And um, you know if you when you go in and you actually look at you know what we're asking kids to do, I did a little video to kind of introduce it to students. And um, you know send me send me a tweet on Twitter, you know what you think. But uh, but that one is probably and that one can be used in a lot of different subject areas. That's right, and I love it. Yes, see Steven show off all of his uh, Legos in that video. We also have one that I'm adding here. I know I don't have the link in there yet. I forgot to test, but it's pulled open in my writable account. Um, this was inspired from Miss Towner, and she's a fantastic teacher, if you follow her on Twitter, um, that combines both Minecraft, because who doesn't love Minecraft, along with writable. So um, they're on this desert island, and they can only choose one survival object. So which animal or which material? material um, would they use and I, I put a step further which um, you know hostile mob as they're called in Minecraft would you avoid um, Tessa shaking her head yes um, so I added that all to the writing assignment and that is uh, something for you to think about blending those different disciplines across the curriculum um, and having them express and show what they know through writing Tess yeah, so I am going to run everybody very quickly through how you can take any of the assignments in Writable and edit them so that they fit your needs or so that you can create an assignment yourself. Writable is not just for English teachers. You do not have to be an expert ELA teacher to create an amazing writing assignment. Um, you can be a PE teacher and you can be a math teacher and we help guide you through creating a really effective assignment. So I'm going to play this video. Um, and uh, you'll notice uh, Steven's Lego assignment at the beginning of it. Um, it's linked in the resource sheet. If anybody wants to go check it out, you just copy it. Um, so let me. All right. So it's really easy to customize. We have over 600 assignments in Writable. You just copy one that you like. You go to your assignments and then you click edit. And this is going to take you into your prompt area, your videos, your rubrics. You can add YouTube videos. You can see I added a YouTube video about Legos and a PDF reading on an instructional booklet from Lego uh, on the Six Bricks Challenge to my assignment. You can add in multiple choice questions. You can add in a graphic organizer, which I did here. You can choose uh, the graphic organizers in Writable or you can add your own if you have one that you really love or a hyperdoc. Um, and then you can enable, enable revision aid, which is AI powered feedback and revision recommendations and some scoring. Um, so if you want your students to be getting on demand revision recommendations as they write, you can see here, I decided I wanted to change Steven's assignment, which was high school to an elementary assignment. So I went in and switched out the rubric uh, you can also upload your own custom district rubric. You can rearrange your rubric. You can change the scoring, the weight, um, really anything you can think of, you can change it in Writable. So you can use these as templates um, or you can go make your own assignment from scratch. So it'll uh, pop us in there in just a second. And again, any content area this works for. So I just click create assignment and it's gonna take me into a little wizard. Uh, so I can choose my assignment type and it'll tell me how I'm going to do this and the steps to making those assignments. So in this case, I'm going to choose a response to reading assignment. And so I decided to go to New York Times Learning, which is an amazing uh, resource, and I chose to copy and paste in 
a reading um, about acts of kindness uh, during the coronavirus. And uh, I wrote a little writing prompt to go aside with it. I also could have uploaded a PDF. Um, you can see I also added a video link to some good news in there um, to go along with it. You can add in your own uh, images too as well. And then I went and I picked a rubric. Again, we have over 1,500 rubric items in our rubric explorer, uh, or you can make your own, or you can use it as a template. It also aligns with your state. So if you wanted to use an SBAC rubric in California, or if you wanted to use um, Georgia Milestones, or um, TN Ready in Tennessee, and then you can keep editing your assignment anytime you want to. Um, and this is also great if you want to duplicate an assignment and level it. So perhaps you have an assignment for different levels in elementary school and you've created different groups. Um, you can always go in and, um, you know, add those graphic organizers, add in revision aid, which you can uh, basically do it to most assignments by just putting in some quick key themes and it automatically trains it. Uh, and then assign it to your students. And when you do assign, um, you can assign directly to the classroom stream. Students can write and embed a Google Doc. So this isn't a new program for students to use if you're already using Google. Um, or you can use uh, Schoology or Canvas. Uh, and it's kind of as simple as that. Um, so you can create your free account at writable.com and explore. And easy peasy. Yeah, I love it. I know um, uh, Stephen and I are both uh, Microsoft Innovator Educator experts. I'm also a, a Google Innovator. And all these things are, um, they streamline nicely with that process. Or if you don't have an LMS, then um, you can use the app alone. So many ways to access Writable. So now that you're teaching remotely, what are you finding as the biggest struggles um, that you didn't know before? I saw a teacher, Stephen, the other day said, um, I learned in two weeks how to locate and upload a PDF to my Google Drive and then share it and then open it as a Google Doc. Um, so it, Listen, what are you hearing? A, a win a win is a win. You know, it, 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 it's, I know that this is, this is a struggle. I talk to teachers every day, and it, this is unprecedented what we're asking teachers to do. I mean, even teachers who I know who I've been working with for years, um, on different areas of, of ed tech are struggling. And, um, and you know what, that's okay. You know, we'll, that's why, you know, I want people to, you know, reach out to um, the folks like, like Tess and Heidi at Writable and people like Shaylin and I, like, that's why we're here. We want to help people. I want people to message me and, and, and let me know and let Shaylin and I know, what do you need? What can we help you with? That's right. So what do you see in Tess? I, well, you know, equity is one that I'm seeing that we talked about, but one that we hadn't really talked about yet is engagement and feedback um, and really yes. get students to engage with you. Um, I think a multimodal uh, approach can be really helpful. So video, obviously, we're all doing, but engaging assignments and readings and instructional videos and projects and um that's right. There's tons of things. And, uh, you know, the way to not only engage kids, but also to deepen those relationships with them is have them write what they care about. So I know, Stephen, like having your girls journal, and I know my kids are doing a pandemic journal as well, and, and just sharing what's important to them right now to capture what's going on. It's, nice, it's not only a nice outlet for their emotions and how they're feeling, but also in the future becomes those primary sources. And I know um, that there's tons of different options out there, so it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a state testing review right now. Uh, there's lots of things kids care about, and just having that that access to, to write it and share their voice, Tess. All right, so now differentiation. Stephen, here we go, meeting the needs of all students. This is a big one. Yeah, I, I mean, this, this is one of our favorite things to talk about because it, it is so important, and especially now in, in these remote environments, um, it's so utterly important to differentiate um, the, the ways that we, you know, we just, we just talked about engagement and, and part of the problem is that students are disengaged because we're asking them to sit in front of their computer for eight hours a day trying to directly replicate what they do in the classroom and that's just mm -hmm. that's a setup for failure 
Um, mm -hmm. And so we can do better than that. And so what we're going to lay out here are some ways to differentiate both, you know, content and process and uh, and and some other things that that really can can work well in the remote learning environment. And and I don't think when Carol Ann wrote this, you know, said this, um, she thought about the remote environment. But certainly this fits it directly in line with with what a lot of people are experiencing today. That's right. So a lot of our um, information and our, our grounding comes from Carol Ann Tomlinson, a guru, um, one of the leading voices in differentiation. She is fantastic. Her resources are, are on that sheet. But when we look at differentiation, it comes in many different forms. Content, right? So what the students need to know. Process, how they are gaining understanding of that content and product. So how are they demonstrating their understanding? Um, but you can't do any of that without assessment. And assessment leads to responsive teaching. Why is that, Stephen? Well, because assessment is like is like what you famously say, it's like a GPS. It's going to inform us as to who our students are as learners, where they are in their learning, and where do they need to go next. Um, and so assessment is is should be at the cornerstone of, of of differentiation because it's what drives the other three. That's right, and we're not talking about summative assessment, right? No, not 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 at all. And and really, in most places, summative assessments have been canceled anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is the perfect opportunity if we haven't if if you haven't experimented or haven't uh, haven't come to understand what formative assessment is. Uh, then formative assessment is, is really what we need to be doing, um, you know, pretty much daily or, or semi-daily in these remote environments of where are students, where are students in their understanding. And it doesn't mean that students are turning in some huge mega product every day. It could be just a check-in. What did you do yesterday? You know, if you had to describe your learning in, in three sentences, what would you say? I mean, those kinds of things can be hugely valuable. Um, when trying to to look at okay, where is the student in their learning? Especially since we don't see them face to face, we have to understand if we want that that instruction to continue remotely. We have to know where they are and where they need to go. That's right. And so we always love to start with this because we want to stress: don't get upside down in the data pyramid. Don't place all your eggs in the basket for that summative assessment that happens once or twice a year. That formative assessment is so essential to make. Uh, differentiated responsive feedback moves um, and change up your instruction. So don't get tied down. Don't get flipped upside down in that data pyramid. And we have like tons more than you'd ever want to know of assessment resources on that document. So you have to check them out. But why in this kind of environment does ed, ed tech support that formative assessment, Stephen? Well, and I saw a bunch of people saying, you know, what well, you have an app that does more than multiple choice. You have some. Yes, well, there are tons of them that that Shaylin and I have suggested on that Padlet and and um, and all these other ones that can be hugely beneficial. But especially now, since a lot of kids are 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 doing things through technology, it's going to give you the ability to understand as time progresses where those students are. So, like where you are in Iowa you know that kids are gonna be out until the end of the year. So let's get a snapshot where they are now, and then we can see how they progress over time by capturing those different data points so that we know at the end of the year, when they come back to school in August or September, where were they when school ended? Um, and, and remember, I know we're talking a lot about ed tech, but if we, we wanna talk about equity too, all of this things, all of this that we're talking about now, while ed tech is certainly beneficial, if that's not a part of the equation, pick up a telephone and call the kid and talk to them. I mean, don't don't hesitate to to look at all other means that can still give you the benefit that we talk about through technology that can that that don't involve any technology at all. But certainly, exactly when you're able to track that over time, it can be hugely beneficial. That's exactly right. Um, so using data to inform ex instruction, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, data is, is the new currency, right? And so data is really what we need to use to, to inform our instruction. If I, 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 again, I talk about my failings as a teacher openly and honestly because I don't want people to follow the same path that I did, you know, as, as long as I did. And, and, you know, I was that teacher who gave the quiz at the end of the chapter or the test at the end of the week. And by then it was way too late. 
And so if I had that data in hand or in the moment of teaching, I could make such more, I could make such a more informed decision making as to where, where were my students in their understanding right then and there. If they needed more, if they needed additional help, I could have stopped and gone and done that. If they were already accelerated beyond where I wanted to go, then we, I could have accelerated with them. It's that data that's going to drive our instruction. We said, we, Shaylin and I do a session for conferences called Data is Not a Four Letter Word. Um, where we talk exactly about this, that data should be dry. We should be using more data to in inform our instruction. That's right. Um, Tess, I know data is a part of Writable. Data is a huge part of Writable. You know, we have gone greatless over much of this con uh, country. And that doesn't mean that we don't still need that data to help us inform our assignments to scaffold our learning, to differentiate our learning and our classes, um, and not just at the end of a lesson, but in the middle of a lesson. Um, I know a lot of people don't even get the kind of data that they need um, until they're finished with the summative assessment, with your state assessments, um, perhaps with your district benchmark assessments. So I'm going to show you guys a little bit in Writable how your students can be writing, and we're actually gathering data on how they're doing by category, skill, and standard, so that you can use that data and take action on it, um, whether you're doing actual assessments or not. So this is really great formative assessment data. Um, So this is really what's gonna what data and assessments are gonna look like um, for you as the teacher or as a district leader. Um, you can run assessments in in Writable if you wanted to um, that were more formal. Uh, you can also do practice for your state assessments. And I know some of you are thinking, well, we don't have to take state assessments. Um, you don't. I think in most of this in this country now for this year, but those skills are still really foundational for your students. Um, and something that you can track and build on. Um, you'll notice I'm looking at a WIDA assignment right now. Um, so, you know, we support, uh, I believe, about 80 or 85% of um, assessments in this country. Uh, you can go and choose those, or you can create your own. Um, this is really building everyday formative assessment practice data and getting that assessment, summative assessment data. Um, so you can see in our dashboard, you can look at scores by category, skill, and standard. You can drive down onto how, this, how a student is performing. Um, you can go look at their actual writing. You'll see here I'm in their rubric. I'm looking at their peer reviews. Um, that is how we are, are building data is based on feedback because our, the rubrics are tied by category, skill, and standard. We also have a reporting function. So this is really great if you want to do some assignments at the end of the year, and then when you start back to school, um, do some assignments in the same genre, and really see how your students are progressing or where they're at, so you know where to start. Um, and you can share this data with coaches, with parents, uh, really easily. That's right. And so, you know, when you're beginning to differentiate, um, you have to know where students are at. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you don't know exactly where they're at, and our elementary friends do a great job um, at this, but if you don't know where they're at, uh, then it's like opening to page one and, and expecting that everybody's there. But that's not always true, right, Stephen? No, it's not true. And, um, you know, there. As we as we see here, there are there are two givens when we talk about um, when we talk about teaching. You know, all of us have content that all of us have standards. No matter what you teach, you've got standards, whether they come from some national organization, some state group, local standard, whatever they are. We all know that we that's that's the world we have to live in. That 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 idea of teaching outside of the box and getting away from standard, we have to have standards. So let's just move past it. Um, and we know that students are going to vary as leaner, as learners. So Shay, what are what do we what do we have to believe? So different teachers that differentiate in their classroom know that everyone doesn't have the same identical mode roadmap for learning, um, but it's important to hold all students to high standards. Um, but they're also students of their students, like we said, responsive um, teaching that embodies common sense. I love this quote by Hattie Fisher and Fry, and this is essential for differentiation. When evidence suggests that learning has not occurred, the instruction needs to change 
not the student. And we're seeing this time and time again. If you're not reaching your kids one way online or in a virtual environment, try something else. Everybody knows that this is a learning process for everyone. Maybe they're not good at Zooming all together or Google Hangouts. Maybe you need to do a discussion board or small group. Um, so lots of different things that you can try to different, differentiate that instruction. But the first way is you can differentiate by content. And you do that either by readiness to support their growth or by interest. So uh, readiness, supporting growth, or interest. And I love this read and respond um, to Cricut because they do just that. They let you share different um, reading passages based on their readiness. Tess? Yeah, I just we just released this really awesome collection with Cricut readings for elementary students. All the readings are leveled. Um, but I also, I'm going to play this, but mention we also have read and respond for every grade level uh, where you can find fiction and nonfiction readings. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a really great skills collection, uh, which you can almost use as a curriculum block, building up on skills for a certain genre of writing. So if you want to build up on the skills for a high school argumentative piece of writing, you can really assign in order, which is great. And we'll just show off our awesome Cricut collection where you will see a little assignment from Shaylin with a little video too. She is makes a, a guest appearance. the read and respond collection with readings for elementary students from Cricut. All assignments include side-by-side -side leveled reading passages. Simply preview the assignment to explore. The voice and choice assignments include a choice of reading passages and prompts which you can preview. Some assignments include a model mini lesson from Shailen Farnsworth. You can keep the lesson or record your own. You can also choose assignments with single reading selections. To use an assignment, click Copy Assignment. You can then edit the assignment or assign it immediately to students. When you assign, you can select different feedback options. Students can write in embedded Google Docs and assignments can be sent directly to the Google Classroom stream or assigned within Schoology or Canvas. Students can access their assignments from their student dashboard in Writable. Readings are easy to highlight and annotate, and students complete their writing next to their reading. Monitoring and guiding student writing progress is easy. When you access the teacher dashboard, we can check in on where students are at in the writing process, and then engage in their writing and revision process by using live feedback. Students are immediately notified of live feedback, which they can then incorporate into their work. Simply create a free account at writable.com to start using the Read and Respond collection with live feedback. There we go. Um, so that is a little bit what Writable would look like from your teacher and your student side. That's just what one of our collections look like. Uh, live feedback is one of our feedback options in addition to teacher grading and feedback to self-review, peer review, revision aid, and originality checking. Um, That's right. And so it's like a perfect balance for that differentiating content because you can put anything in there. You have the response to reading, you have cricket with level reading, but anything you may need to meet those students' needs when you differentiate content to support mm -hmm. growth, you can put in there. So along with uh, differentiating content for growth and for also interest, right? Because you teach the student, you teach the writer, not the text. Um, you also need to differentiate according to process. And process, this is how I explain it. This is not to get in an argument with Stephen about if there's different types of learning styles. Are you kinesthetic? Are you auditory? No, we're, this Stephen is, no, we're not going that. down that. Stephen does not, we're not believe going, that. We are not going down that, that, that road. This is to talk about there are ways that we as adults and all of our students prefer to process things. Sometimes I may want to read them. Sometimes I need a visual. Sometimes I need a mentor explaining it and standing side by side. So processing is how the different types of ways students can consume that information. And we have a few things here. Stephen, gamified learning. 
Yeah, really. I mean, really quickly, Gamified is super fun. I mean, there's uh, on that resource sheet. I know we keep talking about the resource sheet, which is like the number one thing you need to know out of this session because that's where a lot of the of all this information lives. But Gamified, um, you know, it has been shown to if you think about even my own kids, um, they will spend hours and hours and hours doing the same task over and over and over to beat a level. Well, let's take that same ambition and drive and gamify the classroom and, and wrap some content around it. So one of my favorite ones, Breakout EDU, is a gamified way to, to introduce. Adam uh, Bello. It, 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 yeah, my friend Adam Bello to, to do content with students in a really fun and interesting way. That's right. And I'm huge on assistive technology um, because I, I believe assistive technology provides students the ability to work independently and there's tons of different resources on there for assistive technology and how they can process that information i'm a huge fan of microsoft's immersive reader steven and i share that all the time it is beautiful to support students needs and how they process information so make sure that you check out that resource um, we also like to talk about centers or differentiating process through these choice boards now this was all made on google draw, Stephen, and how would you explain something like this? And what's so great about choice boards, especially in this context of thinking about where we are currently with many, many students doing remote learning, don't just pigeonhole students into one way of doing something. Allow them the choice and flexibility and freedom to, to explore different ways of, of understanding and engaging with content. And so that's where the choice board can be hugely beneficial because now like in the way that this one is organized this is one we did for chemistry um, everything you're going to learn about it is at the top at the periodic table so you're going to learn and you've got three different modalities there you can read about it you can do interactive you can look at a video you can dig a little bit deeper and then you can go into a going into a apply through simulations or um, a mixing game so there's lots of different ways for the same kind of content area to meet the needs of a wider body of students through one uh, one platform that students can engage with that, and that's the choice board. That's right, and we have a blank document for you to do your own choice boards if you want to give students um, a concept and have them do different uh, things to process it and end product. Test time for this one. You know, I think we'll probably just skip this one. It's on YouTube if you really want to know, but just talking about scaffolding lessons and adding multimodal components to your writable lessons, making sure that you have videos and videos that you can record yourself so that you're really checking in with students. But um, yeah. That's yeah. right. And I mean, they got an example of me doing a mini lesson and Steven doing his Lego ones. And I love video support and you can just embed it right in all of those writable assignments or you can add one on YouTube. So it's fantastic because kids really want to see you. They want to see your teacher. So we went through pro content. We went through a uh, process and now kids demonstrating their understanding. Steven, product, make sure it's student centered. Make sure it's student centered and the if students can can be able to choose the way that they want to demonstrate their understanding, put them at the center, um, hence student centered, um, but allowing them to justify how what they're going to produce um, meets those learning objectives or meet those learning targets and they take ownership of what they're going to create, they're more likely to create something that demonstrates that in a better way. Um, and, you know, and we love rubrics, you know, we're a big fan of single point rubrics, you know, there, mm -hmm. there used to be uh, rubrics used to be one of those things that they were pretty ubiquitous, but they were pretty terrible because kids <laughs> will do what research shows is the kids will do the bare minimum to get by. Um, you have a very small group of kids who will do um, who will try to get all the fours or get at the top end of the rubric. Most kids will just do the bare minimum to get by. With the one-point rubric, they have to justify why they know what they know um, and why they've met why they've met those um, those standards or those objectives. And so it puts the, again the student in the driver's seat for what they're going to produce. That's right. So you have the set of standards. You have these rubrics. It's more student-centered. You allow them to demonstrate their understanding in multiple ways. What are some things they can do? Well, a traditional essay. There's nothing wrong with having kids write. Um, you know, even, uh, you know, text on a paper, um, visual representation. So we have infographics, we have, um, you know, Instagram posts. I know uh, they can do um, TikToks, which is Tessa's favorite, uh, podcasts, uh, videos. And Stephen, you love digital modeling. What does that mean? Digital modeling. 
I mean, digital modeling thing, you know, a lot of places have 3D printers. Well, you may not have access to it, but maybe you've got access. There's tons of free software out there for, pe for people to create digital models and, um, and problem solve in that way. It can be a great way to use it. This is one of my, this is one of the things that I think is most important. You know, I, I want teachers to avoid recipe learning. And that doesn't mean that you can't do, do mentor models and you can't do some of the things we've already talked about. But if you assign a project or you assign a, an activity and you want students to produce the same thing because it's easier to grade, that's a recipe. And recipes don't belong in classrooms, they belong in kitchens. We want students to be able to have control over what they produce and do it in a way that's meaningful, meaningful to their learning that demonstrates their flexibility and their understanding while still how how can they demonstrate how can they demonstrate what they know related back to the standards that you that you set out to to impart on them that's right so everything does not have to be the same you do not have to have the same end product right um they can demonstrate and differentiate how they demonstrate their understanding so i know we're running out of out of time um a couple highlights here in the resource tips and communities and then tess if there's any questions yeah. steven um created a fantastic digital steam resource list again they're all on that sheet but your favorite one what do you want to point out steven just one uh, just one? Oh, gosh. Um, those FET simulations are pretty awesome because they're science and math. There's some great science and math ones there. And again, helping students see, you know, things like physics and chemistry or, or mathematical algorithms in the natural world. Um, and those are, are not browser specific. They can work on any device. That one is probably, that one's pretty cool. What about your phone? Do they work on the phone? Work on a phone. All right. So also there's tons of different resources for accessibility. My favorite is Immersive Reader with Microsoft um, just because it's unmatched for all the support it gives. But I also know Tess put in there, there's an EdWeb um, that they did and did one that's also important. Tess, do you want to highlight that one? Yeah. EdWeb and CETA did an amazing uh, webinar on IEPs and 504s. Um, we also have a lot of accessibility features and functionality in Writable. Um, I think accessibility is so incredibly important, especially when we're talking about differentiation, because uh, yeah. we have to be accessible to all of our students. Um, That's right. So, yeah. Um, we've talked about a lot of these ones already. Uh, of course, Writable is is at the top of the list because it's just it's it just plays so nicely with so many different um, you know backbone structures. There, but we love Flipgrid, of course, and if we had to put in there Google Draw because there's just so many things you can do. Professional resources. I know uh, Stephen's going to say he loves Carol Ann Tomlinson because he sat right next to her. I, I did. I sat next to her one time. She was signing books. So when I was signing books, her line was a mile long I, and she felt bad for me. So she came over and signed one of my, she signed her name in one of my books. So I think <laughs> I'm honored by that, but yeah, right. that was pretty awesome. Um, Tess put the link um, in the, the chat multiple times. I know Heidi's put it in there, but if you did not get it, take a screenshot of this. You'll also get the link right tomorrow. Tess, do they send out the link? Yeah, I believe for the that. webinar. When the when the webinar goes out, this can be included. Um, that's right, and we of course want you to join our Writable um, Educator Facebook group. That's all on there, um, and j definitely check it out. It is such a, a fantastic platform. But are there questions, Tess, that we want to end with? I know we went four minutes over. I apologize, everyone. Stephen loves to talk. There are there are some really great questions. Um, let me let me choose which one to pick first. Um, what is the best way to assess students authentically now that we are teaching remotely? Oftentimes we get the parents' answers and not the child's. Oh, I have been hearing this from teacher friends too. Um, I, I'm curious to hear your guys' answer on this. Steven? Say it again. I was, uh, I'm busy typing things in the chat. I'm sorry. Oh my gosh, what? Okay, he's kicked off. So I think a couple of things. Yeah. Um, if, if, if it is wondering on how you can authentically get a student voice and not a parent voice, um, in all actuality, we won't know. Mm -hmm. That is just reality. Um, and we're going to have to give everyone the benefit of the doubt um, that they are doing the best that they can to get things done. I, I still believe the importance of, of um, 
communicating with uh, students in small groups or one-to-one, especially those ones that are difficult to reach. Maybe they don't show up on the Zooms. So maybe you need a phone call or maybe you need to reach out through social media. I've heard of, of great teachers using friends of friends to help track them down. So meeting those relationship needs, I think, are extremely important. And then as far as authentic assessment, there's lots of things that you can do in the moment. So a lot of those formative assessment tools you can use right in the mo- moment, like Ed, uh, Ed Puzzle, Pull Everywhere, um, or uh, things like that would give you that just-in-time uh, um, feedback. But it's yeah, a difficult I situation. About, I just wrote a blog post about non-digital ways to um, to get kids um, to get kids learning. And so, you know, if technology is an issue, I, I created an, a list of, of things to do. And I will say uh, on the parent note, you know, if, if that's a concern, totally genuine, but maybe we think about it and maybe we, we put a positive spin on it and say, you know, we want parents involved in their kids' education. And maybe this might be an opportunity where kids do finally have their parents involved in what they're learning. And so maybe that might not be such a bad thing after all. That's right. Didn't you just have an, on that document to like share uh, history, like family history? Um, yeah, through a, your a living history thing? project could be a great way. Uh, could be a great way to to get them involved. Certainly, I, I think right. it's time to build relationships too with those family members that you don't always get to see at, at parent teacher conferences. Um, I think you also touched on something I've heard from my teacher friends is that large group instruction is really hard right now, but mm-hmm. small group instruction when you're teaching online um, can be really effective. And maybe your small group instruction includes the parents and that's okay. Um, you know your student's writing. And so your gut also can guide you um, to right. if it matters or not. Let me ask you right and, and speaking of writing, of course, I have to uh, share this one again, because I'm very passionate about c- connecting kids um, to other peers across the nation through writing. And I, I love that Writable is doing this project right together. So connecting your classroom with peers, that could be motivating as well. Um, Tess, is there another question for Stephen and I? Yeah. Uh, someone said, I'd like to hear more about what Stephen believes, if not an auditory, visual, kinesthetic, tactile oh. learners. So I blame Shaylin for that. Like, look, I, you know, what? there was that notion that, you know, you gave a kid mm-hmm. a test and they, oh, they're a kinesthetic learner and that's the only way that they learn. I mean, that that whole multiple intelligences or m- multiple learning style things is is junk science. I, I do believe that kids have multiple different ways that they learn. What I don't believe is that we pigeonhole them into one way. Um, as Shaylin likes to tease me about that, but certainly we need to be looking at the, the, dif- the different ways that students learn and differentiate in according to that, and that's where process comes in. But it doesn't mean that just because today this student likes to read, tomorrow they'll, they'll want to do it the same way. They'll want to engage in the content that same way. Um, so it's not that every kid has one style. It's that we all have multiple styles depending on the day and the time and mood and all of those things. That's right. Um, um, I do want to answer a writable question that popped up here and that I Definitely. thought was Definitely. That how does writable deal with the inconsistency of intermittent participation inherent mm-hmm. in virtual learning? And I like to open this wider in that how do you in general deal with the inconsistency of intermittent participation inherent in virtual learning? Whether it's equity issues that cause participation or mm-hmm. uh, parental involvement or time of day. I think um, feedback is the first thing that comes to my mind. And I know in Writable, we have a lot of guided feedback, and that means we're guiding students to get feedback on their own work, on each other's work, to help them stay engaged, to help the teacher engage with them. So I think um, non-time specific feedback Mm -hmm. so that they can really work on their own speed, but be doing something that is um, humanistic and and communicative and relationship building at the same time. Um, I'm curious what you guys think about though uh, as well for intermittent participation well I think um, I I think you hit the nail on our yeah I think you I think you hit the the, the head on the nail in that um, you know the end of the year is coming Uh, we have to streamline exactly what is essential to get across connect with our kids for them to learn um, while we have them at a short time that we do and uh, 
uh, so streamline all that and realize that um, they have a lot of things on their shoulders right now um, besides schooling that they're dealing with. And so it may not be all at one time. So what are those important things and not maybe having those constraints of time? Stephen? And what's that R word? What's that R word? Relationship. That's what's important. That's right. So Tess, do you want to take us out of here? I know Stephen, um, you, you want to uh, shout out, you have some races to watch. Aren't they doing some virtual racing? <laughs> oh, you mean my virtual NASCAR with my tires and my sheet metal that you can see over my shoulders? Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm looking forward to getting back to a little sense of normalcy when the cars are back on the track. But uh, I appreciate everybody for taking the time to learn with us. Um, Shaylin, you are amazing. Tess, you're amazing. Heidi, you're amazing behind the scenes and everybody at, at EdWeb. And um, please, if anybody has any questions, please reach out to us. You can find me on Twitter at Web20Classroom, and I'll be happy to help. That's yeah. right. And I just want to thank everyone as well. I want to thank Writable. I want to thank Tess and Heidi, my amazing partner, Stephen, for for uh, sharing his wisdom and differentiation, but also in his science and math to get people inspired during this time and, and share some of his brilliance. And I do want to make a plug if you guys know Ken Shelton on Twitter. I know Stephen, one of your very good friends. He is going to be leading our Twitter chat tomorrow, Writing Matters. Um, and we're going to be talking about equity and equity and writing practices and how to be culturally responsive um, in, in what we do as educators. So that'll be fantastic. So that info is out there as well. Tess, I'm handing it over to you. Yes, everybody, uh, please yeah. join hashtag writing matters chat tomorrow at four o'clock Pacific, seven o'clock Eastern. I am so excited about this one. And it is another amazing community is the writing matters community online. Um, thanks to Stephen inventing hashtag ed chat. There are some really amazing ed chats out there. And I think writing matters is a is a fantastic one. Um, thank you both so much for your wisdom and humor and generosity and for sharing um, with everybody today. I'm, I'm so uh, blessed to have had you guys here and thank you. And if you need anything, um, hello at writable.com or Tess at writable.com goes right to me. I am here to help you. I'm here to support you. There is no such thing as a silly question. Um, reach out to me for whatever you need. <laughs>